Hello, welcome. <laughs> My name is Lonnie Gonzalez. I'm with the City of Austin. Um, and on behalf of our Economic Development Department and Cultural Arts Division, I want to invite you to Austin, Texas for the 2016 NAMP Conference. <laughs> You, you may have heard our motto, Keep Austin Weird. Well, I can't think of a better way to do that than by inviting uh, all of you to Austin. <laughs> and with over 150 people moving to Austin every day, chances are that by this time next year, many of you will already have relocated, so it makes it easy, right? Um, we welcome you, though, with open arms because we know that arts, culture, and creativity are what make our unique identity and boost up our economy and create a good quality of life. Uh, please enjoy this brief tour of our Austin art scene, and I can't wait to share it with y'all in person in 2016. Thanks. Welcoming you to the Austin Arts Tour. Austin has a culture all its own. There's just not that many places like Austin. There's beauty and music and art everywhere you look. Creativity is part of the lifeblood of this city. A day doesn't go by that you don't see something new and original that's been created by somebody in Austin. Austin art is ever-changing, uh, it's growing. It seems like it's in this constant state of budding. There's so many different artists and different voices and they're all very diverse and very unique and that's what makes this place really, really special. The idea of Austin being kind of this hidden gem, it's a nice surprise when people do come here and they find it. I think that that's why Austin is growing at such a fast pace because we have such an amazing creative class who's really open to making cool stuff. Art and culture matter here. Thanks for taking our tour and come back again soon. We're always adding new stops. for Austin 2016. <laughs> Next part of our program I am very excited to announce is NAMP Ignite. <laughs> Ignite presentations are a fast-paced geek event that began in 2006 in Seattle. Some of you may be familiar with Ignite uh, forms of presentations. They're really about having fun um, and kind of stepping away from death by PowerPoint. <laughs> we have a great team of presenters here who have been working hard over the past few months uh, to prepare for what you're about to see. So if you see them over the next couple days, please give them a huge hug or buy them a drink because they really deserve it. I would like to give a special thanks to Ron Evans, who's a member of the NAMP Advisory Committee. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Ron over the past few years, in particular this year uh, with NAMP Ignite. Uh, he has done a wonderful job of helping me to curate this event and really teach me a lot about uh, corralling a wonderful group of experts um, setting deliverables and uh, really putting together a true team. And it's been wonderful to watch this all come together. Uh, this is one of the sessions that I'm most proud of. But uh, 
That being said, also know that this was a grand experiment. And um, we had a lot of fun doing it. So um, also know that it, it is lighthearted, have fun, and um, be forgiving. If there is a, a mistake, a mistake uh, their, slides will be, their slides will be advancing automatically every 15 seconds. So know that these are very brave souls that are making these presentations. And um, because they are so brave, we believe that uh, everyone deserves walk on music and walk off music. Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, welcome, our first six Nap Ignite presenter, so, Selena Juno Vogel from Fractured Atlas. All right, I'm Selena. I work for Fractured Atlas. We are a nonprofit tech company. Mostly we build software to help artists run their business. So what are we doing milling blocks of wood? What is this weird object? It's a new project we're playing with called Make Time Clock. Uh, it's basically a Fitbit for creative projects. And the way that we devised this device um, is an example of design thinking, a framework and a methodology I want to tell you about in four and a half minutes. <laughs> Five steps to design thinking. Um, it basically helps you hone in on a specific uh, problem or issue and then generate a bunch of creative solutions to that issue. Um, to tell you the story, I'm going to introduce you to Mara and Chap. They met in art school. Chap took a right turn and became a software engineer. He works for us. Mara took a left turn and she became a quilter. In 2013, Mara's beautiful hand-dyed, hand-sewn quilts were recognized by Martha Stewart with an American Made Award. This is a big deal. She blew up. Um, lots and lots of business coming her way. A lot of the responsibilities of running a business is social media. And she started to have a hard time making time for the creative work, for the actual making. Without knowing it, Chap, her husband, housemate, has stumbled into phase one of design thinking. This is the empathize phase. It's about understanding, deepening and expanding the understanding of an issue, an individual, and an audience, figuring out what matters to them. So he's talking to Mara. He's figuring out that she really needs to make time for the creative work. That's why she's in it. Um, she needs to figure out how much time she needs to spend creating, how to keep that time sacred, and not let it bleed into the social media and the other uh, junk of running things. So this is the define phase, second phase of design thinking. He's distilling his learning. He's telling a story. He's figuring out what her needs are, and he's honing in. He's bringing the whole problem into a specific challenge. From here, Chap's going to naturally start generating different possible solutions to Mara's challenge. Um, what you see here are a bunch of sketches, a bunch of possible solutions. Maybe it's an app, maybe it's an egg timer. How do we measure her time creating? How do we keep that sacred and keep her aware of her creative rhythm? That is phase three of design thinking, ideation. It's not about finding the perfect idea right away, it's about coming up with a bunch of different ideas. Like Jad said this morning, it's the 15 leads, the 15 chases to get to the four good stories. It's a similar thing, as many possibilities as possible. He chooses one of these possibilities. This is the first prototype of Make Time Clock. He builds it cheap and fast in less than a day. It's a $20 microcontroller, a toggle switch LED screen, threw it in a cardboard box, hands it off to Mara to start playing with. This is a prototyping phase. It's about being cheap and fast. It's about making something to give your users as quickly as possible so you can get their feedback as quickly as possible before you waste any more time refining something that's not going to work. Uh, he's learning from building, and um, he makes that prototype. Mara's using it. She's testing it, measuring her creative time on her quilts, gives him feedback. He makes a new prototype, gives that to another artist friend. They give him feedback. These are some of the early beta testers of these prototypes in their different creative spaces, measuring their creative rhythm. This last phase of design thinking is the testing phase. It's all about finding a small group of friendly betas to play with your tools, to play with your prototypes, and to immediately take their feedback there, what worked, what didn't, and apply it to the prototyping process. So rather than being just a linear framework through those five steps of design thinking, those last two are a little flywheel. It's all about building something quick, 
putting it in the user's hands, getting the feedback, and then immediately applying it to the next prototype and running it again and again until you get something you really like. So this is a little reel of some of the prototypes that Chap built in the last year. You can see he's playing with the idea of like, is it how many lights are there? What is the shape of the object? Um, are we tracking the total amount of time? Or is it the daily rhythm that's more important? So eventually he settles on a model he likes and we're taking it to the next phase of testing. Kickstarter, we launched on Monday, uh, is testing for us. We want to test and see if there's a market for a Fitbit for creative process. If we get backed, great. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll make it a regular program line. If not, eh, on to the next thing. So design thinking, five steps. Obvious now how you apply it to a product, but it can be applied to um, non-physical things as well. How might we engage our audiences more in our programming? How can we leverage our board members a little more? It's about the questions, like Jad said this morning getting into those deep, deep questions. Really question, who is the audience for this particular challenge? What do they need? Listen to them. Uh, how might we address that need? And how can we quickly show them the possible solutions so we can get their feedback about what works or what didn't? So that was five minutes, quick and dirty on design thinking. Um, you should learn more. Google it. There's great books and videos, a lot of depth of knowledge here. Um, learn about it practice it, try it out, iterate on it. And if you'd like to help us iterate, please check out maketimeclock.com or find us on Kickstarter. Ladies and gentlemen, Letitia Buckley. I don't dance. Good music, though. Data collection methods. What? Yes. Bad data. Huh? Does it really matter? The Los Angeles County Arts Commission operates and programs the Ford Theaters, which is a 1,200-seat outdoor amphitheater in the heart of Hollywood. We have a really non-traditional presenting model in that we co-produce and co-present with local LA County-based artists. And as you can imagine, that results in a really eclectic mix of performances, participatory programming, and family programming. Um, and we really pride ourselves in reflecting the diversity of LA County, both on stage and in our audiences. Over the course of the last few years, we've been doing both print and electronic surveys. Um, to say that the print survey distribution method was a little less structured would be, well, you know. Um, not quite as thought through, but we knew something was not right. Um, although the results were favorable, we weren't sure that the method of distribution were actually providing a representative sampling of our audience. And so, um, not really representing the diversity of the county. As we kept saying, our methods were not rigorous. We couldn't actually trust that the data um, was painting an accurate picture. and we knew we needed to do something about it. So love it or hate it, data collection methods do matter. So in 2014, we developed a new audience survey plan um, that focused on a higher standard of practice and obtaining a more representative sampling of our audience. Um, our hypothesis was in order to get that random sampling or that representative sampling, we needed to distribute printed surveys in venue at random intervals. And so, over the course of the summer season, 51 events, we distributed both electronic and paper surveys to what ended up being about a third of our audience. Um, shows were selected based on the expected attendance for that evening. Um, and so, for example, if 20% of our season was likely to have a predominantly Latino audience, 20% of our sample over the course was likely to be predominantly Latino audiences. Uh, we distributed paper surveys at the entrance to the theater to the X person. And X was determined based on the total count of the shows for that evening, that particular performance. Uh, we distributed um, electronic surveys to people who had actually provided their email at point of purchase. And point of purchase for us includes phone and third party ticket retailers or resellers. And that actually meant half, less than half of those folks, we had their emails. So we looked at both the results of the paper and online surveys, and paper only. Paper and online survey results, a predominantly white audience. 
but through the paper only results, very different cultural makeup, predominantly Latino audience. So although we had fewer responses, that was okay for us because we had an improved sampling frame and distribution methods for our paper survey and a more representative sample of our audiences. Um, shows were chosen with purpose. We knew what we were doing. Print, online, print random, online, non-random. And therefore, um, we believe that the results, the paper survey results are more representative of the Ford audience. And I just love this picture. <laughs> Don't you feel it? You feel it? Yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> And we also know for us that paper survey results continue to be the best way, paper survey distribution in the venue continue to be the best way to determine the makeup of the Ford audience. And, you know, I know online surveying is easier and maybe less expensive to administer and to analyze and you don't have that like pesky data entry stuff at the end of it, um, but that's okay. For us, at least, it's okay because we know that the best method to gather a random sampling to get the most representative, sample, uh, representative of our audiences is through paper surveys. So our conclusion, paper surveys are in, online surveys are out. <laughs> because love it or hate it, data collection, matter, data collection methods do matter. Thank you. Next up from the New York Don't Transit Museum, Julia Walta Weingard. Riding the subway in New York City is a total experience. With over six million commuters riding the train each day, you never know who you might see or what might happen. Every morning, I ride the subway to my job at the Transit Museum in downtown Brooklyn. The museum is a really unique space. It's housed inside of a decommissioned subway station from 1936, and it looks and feels and sometimes smells like the subway. <laughs> sometimes people wander in through our stairs looking for the A train, and we have to tell them, yes, the train ran here, but you're about 70 years too late. Inside the museum, we have traditional exhibits as well as a lot of interactive collections. People can sit at the wheel of a city bus and they can push through turnstiles. On our lower level, we have over 20 vintage subway and elevated cars that span almost every decade back to 1904 when the subway was first built in New York. You can board these trains and sit on the rattan seats and hang on the leather straps as you read advertisements that reflect the social and political context of the era when they ran. Often the messages in these ads connect with our contemporary experiences of riding the subway. These are the Transit Museum's biggest and most dedicated fans, young people and the young at heart. Both go nuts for our model train sets and they spend hours in the museum, enchanted with our space. We were interested in reaching those middle audiences, the nearly six million commuters who ride the subway every day. And we did that by going out and meeting them out where they were commuting in the system already. And we encouraged them to connect their experiences commuting with our physical collections and with our historic objects. Since our collections are on wheels, we're able to take them out into the system. You can imagine your surprise as you're waiting on the platform on your way to a Yankees game and these cars from the 20s and 30s pull up in front of you. The excitement and delight on people's faces as they ride in cars from Joe DiMaggio's era is key. Suddenly, their experiences riding these cars relate them directly to the historic narratives of the city. As we started running these trains more and more, we noticed that people were using them as a backdrop for their own meetups. <laughs> like these swing dancers clad in clothing from the 1920s, who created their own pop-up swing party on the platform in Lower Manhattan. So we took our cues from them. We invited over 300 dancers and jazz musicians to meet us on the platform in Manhattan, and we all boarded a vintage train and ran express directly into the Transit Museum. We delivered the dancers and music musicians into our historic space, and we transported them into a new era. The museum 
provided the authenticity and the historic accuracy that the dancers craved. And the event felt very intimate and exclusive. It was a huge success on Instagram. No nostalgic filters necessary. <laughs> In addition to this pension for the nostalgic and the good old days, New York is full of creative people, and we wanted to include their experiences too. So we said, have an idea or an opinion about transportation? We'll provide a platform for expression. We invited artists and academics to submit creative proposals, and then we brought them into the museum space, and we popped them up throughout the museum. We had art installations, poetry readings, live bingo, dance performances in the cars, a huge range. And some of the other specifics that that included was a live radio drama set in and inspired by a subway car from the turn of the century. Down at the bottom, we have a yarn bomber who created cozies for each individual arm of our historic turnstiles. <laughs> With this big mix of cross-disciplinary artists, we were able to provide something for everyone in the museum. And people explored nooks and crannies of the space that we had never programmed before. The artists brought their own followers, and we saw a huge diverse range of people from all different creative communities in the city, as well as across the city, across the country. And what we saw as the night wore on was that the lines became a little bit blurred between these pop-up installations and our historic permanent collections. So by running these, running these creative sensory rides and immersive experiences, we were able to harness the energy around these one-of-a-kind intimate experiences that adult consumers are craving today. And as institutions in the cultural sector, we're not just venues. We are all in a really unique position to be able to offer and add a bit of authenticity and historic and artistic accuracy to these experiences that the consumers can't find anywhere else. And the most compelling part for me and our audience, I think, is that these experiences, just like riding the subway, you never know what might happen or who you might see. Thank you. Next up from the city of brotherly love, John McNerney. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm incredibly nervous. This is my first Ignite presentation. I'm here to talk to you about loyalty and cheating. So I'm going to cheat and start with a blackout. But Ron said that we have to do really bold and clear graphics, so here's my first slide. Can everybody see this? <laughs> All right. Actually, loyalty is not this complicated. This is actually um, trying to show the complexity of the Afghan war. It was actually oddly effective. I'm here, though, to talk about your audiences, and I have news for you. Your audiences are cheating on you. They're not hanging out like they used to. Um, how's that subscription campaign going? Um, I think like a lot of groups out there, you're probably finding that some of your most loyal fans are not coming out as much. But they actually are coming out, they're just not coming out to your organization. <laughs> Attendance is increasing across communities. The problem is that there's also an incredible amount of more things going on. So in a situation like that, how do we build loyalty when people are not loyalty to the specific institutions, they're, loyalty, they're loyal to the experience? So we need to come up with a different way to build loyalty across different communities. So I propose that we put together a, wait for it, arts turducken. A turducken is a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey. The whole is greater than the part, and that's what we need to work on together. And I think we can do that working collectively to build engagement. So every city has in their city a centralized arts or tourism group that markets the arts collectively. And I'm suggesting that if we work with them, we can build loyalty and get back to that same idea of the script sub subscription model, but do it in a collective way. So here's my only complicated slide. The theory is that we would start with awareness, and then we would activate people through discounts, create great experiences, and then from a central location, we would give them points and create rewards, creating art zombies. Then these art zombies, would go out and spread through word of mouth and social media their enthusiasm and addiction to all their friends and keep the cycle going and we would be able to create this, this whole experience and this whole amount of loyalty across the community. So here's how we're going to do it in Philly, but it can be done in any city. We're going to start fun perks, we're going to get people to log into the central location, give us their information, and then we're going to start giving them points when they buy tickets to different institutions. So from that central website, you can see all the great events that are happening, and we're creating a new marketing channel based on rewards and loyalty. 
Then people, when they buy those tickets and they start to build those points, they can also earn points from social media. So we can now give them points when they post your hashtag on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And what's great is you don't have to no longer pay Facebook to get exposure, but you can reward your fans to actually tell their friends. Then they come back to the website, they can see all the great prizes that you've donated to the centralized website, and when we see what they purchase or what they redeem, we get a better sense of what kind of experiences motivate them, and then we can better understand how to create more experiences that are more relevant to the changing nature of audiences. So here's an example. This family saved up their points and got a meet and greet with the band Kiss. They were so excited as they got close to getting their points, they were sharing like mad. They were making sure that every ticket that they purchased, that they got points so they could get to this level. You know, there's a lot of marketing groups out there that will sell you information about consumers and what they do. What's great about this idea is we would build that knowledge from our own audiences and from our own loyalty program. So we would understand real people, not segmentation. So here's a typical arts consumer. This is Walter. We don't know a lot about Walter, but we know that he loves music. We know that we've seen him at a couple different Irish festivals, and we know he likes to hang out with a lot of his friends from the kennel. Now Walter joins the loyalty program. Everyone realizes this guy's really into heavy metal music and into St. Patrick's Day, and, <laughs> and that's what's driving his participation. So now we're able to great, create this great experience. Here's Walter with all his friends, <laughs> and they're experiencing Kiss. And uh, this is at the Wagner. They're having a great time. His friends have all signed up for the loyalty program. This is the first time they've ever came to that institution. So at the end of the day, Walter is exhausted from running around, creating excitement, spreading the word about all the amazing things that you're doing. We have a better understanding of a core segment of our audience and know how to adapt our programming in the future. So I will just leave you with the final slide, which is my wife making our annual Thanksgiving pug ducking. Thank you. <laughs>
And there have been challenges. Sometimes these come from the fellows themselves. So they feel a lot of pressure when they're told to experiment. They feel like they have to do something massive that's going to have a huge impact on their organization. But that's not the case. Often the best experiments are the ones that are integrated into their daily marketing practice. And sometimes the fellows have some challenges with their colleagues who are suspicious about this agile working and feel like it's going to be all about throwing away all the amazing planning they've been doing. But that's not the case. It's about planning in a different way, about working in shorter timescales, being more flexible and responsive. But they've overcome these challenges, and I'm going to introduce you to some of our wonderful digital marketing superheroes. So the first one I'm going to introduce you to is Steve Woodward, superhero Steve. And Steve had never worked in this way before, but he really went for it with the Digital Marketing Academy. He wanted to build a website that would bring together schools and arts organizations in London, and he decided to put this out as a beta version, something he'd never done before. He was nervous about it, his organization were nervous about it, but it provided him with such great feedback from the communities that he wanted to engage with that he's now been able to build something that is about to go live and that he knows is going to have the impact that he wants it to have. I'm going to introduce you to two other digital marketing superheroes, uh, Jen and Anna, who will appear in a second. And they're from an organization called Fact. And they wanted to look at how they could segment their audiences using gamification and play. So they developed one of those questionnaires, a bit like a quiz you get in a magazine where you find out if you're more Gwen Stefani or Miranda Lambert. But they did it instead with, what typeface are you? So they put together a questionnaire, and they had enough questions in there that would give them really useful information about the people that responded. And they got their highest ever response rate, and people shared this questionnaire beyond their usual audiences. So what next for the Digital Marketing Academy? We would love to do an international one. After all, there are no barriers, perhaps some time zone issues, but we can overcome those. So you might already be a digital marketing superhero. If you're not, and you'd like to find out more about our fellows and our mentors, they've written case studies, they've shared blogs, and you can find them here. I'm here until Monday, uh, so if you want to ask me any questions, please do. Other than that, I hope you have a really lovely day, and thank you for listening. <laughs>
That's the least that's going to happen. It's a way to a quick death, let me tell you. Okay? People feel very, very strongly about this. Now, as a side note, in France, they have cell phone jammers. You just flip a switch, jams all the cellular frequencies around you. How many of you would like one of those <laughs> on the train, huh? Okay, it can happen. Let's go over a few of the highlights. At the top of the list, parking and directions. Parking and directions. People want to know how to get there and where they can park. Now you think about it, they're coming to the art space, they're stressed out, they don't know where to park, they don't know how to get there. How are they supposed to empathize with these characters in the play or be ready to receive what we're talking about, okay? We need to keep their stress levels down. And this is something that we have at our fingertips. We just don't often share it. Another thing at the top of the list was, please tell me the show information. What's the synopsis? What's the runtime? Is it age appropriate for children? What's the background information about the artist? Okay, we have this information around us. Also, a huge increase with people saying they now prefer to buy online. They don't want to call the box office. They're making their choices online. So how that thing looks on a mobile device is important. New this year, we ask them, if you had the opportunity, would you check in to the venue on your phone with an e-ticket? 48% of the people said, yes, absolutely. Okay, Probably driven by the check-in at airports, right? Isn't it easier to have it on your phone at this point? Right? So huge response. So a couple of highlights. Logistics. Logistics is what it's all about. It's the unsexy stuff. It's the stuff that us, we as marketing people don't think about. It's what people are looking for. Okay? And we have that nearby. Try your own stuff out. Try to buy a ticket on your ticketing system. Try to go onto your website and look what it looks like on mobile. It's pretty easy to test this stuff out and you can see what their experience is gonna be like. Set some guidelines too. Often either we tell people, no, you can't use your cell phones, or worse, we don't say anything at all. Let's give people some creative outlet for their mobile devices and tell them when they can and can't do it. And it's the Wild West right now, guys. You can experiment. This is an actor who is having a text talk back to people that just saw his performance and he's answering questions after the show, right? If we're gonna experiment, now's the time. The full report's up on the website, group of minds slash mobile 2015. Uh, all of you right now that have a cell phone, could you pull it out for me right now and hold it up? Hold it up for me right now. There we go. I just wanted to see those little screens. Good. All right. Thank you. We don't have to fight this anymore. We can make this benefit us.